Uh, and now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's host, J. Paul Halferty. Paul is completing his PhD dissertation, A History of Gay Male Theater in Toronto at the University of Toronto. Before returning to graduate school, Paul was assistant producer at Dada Camera, the theater company of playwright and actor Daniel McIver, and producer Sherry Johnson. With Johnson, he also worked on Six Stages, an international theater festival that was held in Toronto from 1997 to 2005, and on McIver's early film projects. He has taught at York University, the University of Toronto, and at Brock University, mainly in the areas of theater history, acting, and gender and sexuality studies. His work has been published in Theater Research in Canada, Canadian Theater Review, and in the anthology Queer Theater in Canada. He is associate editor of Trans Performing. Nina Arsenal, it's always so hard to get the parentheses in there. Uh, an unreasonable body of work published by Intellect Press as well as being a contributor to the anthology. Since 2000, Paul has served on the board of directors of Buddies in Bad Times Theater. Canada's oldest and largest queer theater company, and was president of the board from 2008 to 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Hoffman. Um, so in tonight's program, we will see two short films by Nina Arsno and Jordan Tannehill. Um, and Arsno will be telling an autobiographical story, which is titled, The Ecstasy of Nina Arsno, A Surgical Pilgrimage Through a Waking Facelift. Um, following, uh, following this, I, I will host a, a question and answer period with all of you. So Nina Arsno is a Toronto-based multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary artist. She works in live performance, art, video art, photography, and creative writing. To finance her 69 cosmetic procedures, Nina worked for over a decade in the sex business as an internet webcam girl, a prostitute, a stripper, and a mistress, all reputable, all reputable professions to which she applied herself admirably. <laughs> her play, The Silicon Diaries, chronicles her unreasonable and heroic quest for beauty. Its seven stories tell, uh, tell of her black market silicone injections, a brief encounter with, with rocker Tommy Lee, and the depth, the depth of her obsessions. The play ultimately reveals her complex and metaphysical relationship with a manufactured substance, silicone. Her second play, I Was Barbie, documents an Ativan flavored evening when Arsino was hired to portray Mattel's much loved plastic doll at her 50th birthday party. Between 2008 and 2012, both plays toured across Canada to major cities to, and, and sold out theaters and consistent praise from critics. Nina's photographic work, um, what she calls collaborative self-portraiture, documentary images of her body at all stages of metamorphosis, as well as symbolic portraits, have been created with some of Canada's top fashion photographers, pornographers, and fine art image makers. These works have been shown at the National Gallery of Canada as, featured, as the featured artist in a symposium called Beauty, Art, and the Female Form. They have also been shown, shown at major Canadian and American universities, contemporary art journals, and the, world, uh, and, the world, and the world of numerous online art sites. In 2012, as Jim alluded to, um, Intellect uh, Books published Transperforming in our show an unreasonable body of work. The book contains the published uh, Silicone Diaries script, selections of Nina's photographic pieces, and lengthy analysis of and interpretations of her work by a collection of scholars, critics, and artists. Nina also makes videos. She's made work with some of Canada's top filmmakers, and currently she is working on a solo long-form uh, video called The Ophelia Machine, inspired by Heiner Muller's Handle Machine. Nina performed a durational experience of monasticism called 40 Days and 40 Nights, working towards a spiritual experience. As part of this piece, she spent ex extended, times in, extended time in darkness, fasted, and experimented with sleep deprivation. Then she entered into a, a series of aesthetic rituals, prayers, meditation, rigorous exercise, storytelling, self-whipping, and automatist drawings. Nina thrives, uh, Nina thrives in, in the exploration of new and profound ways of living her art practice. Her work has been called profoundly moving, absolutely unforgettable, brutally honest, a spiritual gift, 
as well as stunning and ruthless. You can see more of her work on her website, ninarsnow.com, where she's selling her, selling her Whore of Babylon uh, apocaly an apocalyptic pinup calendar for 2013. A selection of photographs, <coughs> a selection of photographs from the apocalyptic erotic landscape of a woman who has given herself to thousands of men and now finds sexual pleasure in the queerest of places. Um, thank you very much again for coming. We're very, very happy to be here and I hope you enjoy the program.
I hated waiting to see what it was all going to turn out like. And yet, there's something that said amongst the girls of my tribe. And when I say the girls of my tribe, I want to tell you what I mean by that. I don't just mean transsexual women. I mean the plastics. I mean those of us who've had so much plastic surgery to annihilate as much of the masculinity we can from our bodies that we will forever be plastic. And what we say is that once you're in the game, you're in the game for good. You're in the game for your whole life, the plastic surgery game. And we also say this. Don't go down to see the doctor quicker than five years because you'll screw things up but don't wait longer than seven. Because if you wait longer than seven, you cannot put things back into place. I was almost at seven years. I said to my friends, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I have every right to age. I have every right to age, just like a biological woman would have the right to age, just like a woman who had never had plastic surgery has the right to age. I did not have to maintain this image. I could let it all fall apart so unnaturally but because my face is so unnatural, what it would mean when it would start to age, it would mean that the cheeks were slipping down my face. I wasn't going to look like a normal person who was just going to get old. There's, in fact, no one's ever really seen faces like that. So the only way that people could interpret them as, is grotesque. Things were slipping millimeter by millimeter. And um, not only was I no longer beautiful, it was impossible to actually tell that I ever was beautiful, period. That, that was very, very difficult for me to stomach that. But I told my friends, I'm going to do it. I'm going to let everything fall apart. It's the most avant-garde thing that I could possibly do. <laughs> <laughs> but I did this play called The Silicon Diaries. And the Silicon Diaries is all about all the plastic surgeries that I had to feminize myself and my quest for beauty. And then the Silicon Diaries was getting booked down in the States, and there was some talk that it was going to go to Europe. And I'd never had plastic surgery before for professional reasons, not for my career. It was a whole new reason to have plastic surgery. And yet, once I'd made that decision, something in me, my sexuality, was activated. There was something in me that just came alive, deep down inside, maybe on the pelvic floor, somewhere down there. Oh my god, my boyfriend was thrilled. He saw the, that old part of me that he loved in me, that part of me that he fell in love with, the part of me that he used to call the tigress. He was more than happy to pay for it. <laughs> I asked Patrick for $14,000 so I could down, go down to Guadalajara. And the reason why we go down to Guadalajara is because there's a doctor down there, Dr. Sunny. And good old Dr. Sunny is very empathetic to girls like me. He's not all caught up in the idea that plastic surgery has to be natural looking. He's not. Dr. Sunny understands our needs. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. It's very difficult to get down to Guadalajara, though. We can't go through the States because, um, us Canadian girls, because once we're registered sex workers, it's very hard to get through American customs. And um, there's uh, no direct flight to Guadalajara, so we have to go through Mexico City Airport. There's a stop over there for eight hours. Now, at this point in the story, I want to tell everyone what it's like to travel as a transsexual. You're locked into an aircraft for about six hours. You cannot move. I've traveled by myself at times, and I've been surrounded by soccer teams. And one time it was a soccer team when I went down to Mexico. They were on their way down for a cultural exchange to play soccer with other Mexican kids. And just because it's a cultural exchange doesn't mean that they're not transphobic. They, they absolutely were. I could not get away from them. They were all around me. They were verbally abusing me. And at this point in the story, I would like to speak to the psychic wound that it means to be transgender. Because we can talk about being trans and being a proud trans woman. 
but for a moment I want you to imagine with an open heart and an open mind what you would feel like tomorrow morning if you woke up and you looked in the mirror and you saw the genitals of the opposite sex on your body in the mirror. What kind of trauma would that put inside of you? What panic, what feelings of panic would that put into your body? Would you be able to give and receive love effectively? Would you be able to function in society? And this is a hypothetical situation I'm asking you to consider because this is actually not what happens to transsexuals. We don't wake up one morning and discover we have the wrong bodies. For me, it was something that I discovered when I was about three years old. It was a slow burn, slow realization. And so the next thing I would like to ask you to consider is what psychological resources does a child have to make those adjustments? So that's the depth of the psychic wound that I'm speaking of. And that can give someone post-traumatic stress disorder or that thing that's called post-traumatic stress disorder complex, which is when the wound is reopened every day. When people call us a man, when people tell me I'm not a real woman, when people make fun of me, when they laugh at me, it's like throwing sand in that deepest, deepest wound. People say get over it, but they, they, they don't understand. And so, I didn't actually know how I was going to get down to Guadalajara again. It hurt so much. So I hired my friend Jordan Tannehill to come down with me. And Jordan's wonderful because he's a, not only is he an artist, he's a video artist. So he could document the trip and he could take photographs. And I also made the decision that I wanted to stay awake during the facelift because I was going to speak, I was going to speak a soliloquy from Lady Macbeth with no skin on my face. It was going to be a performance art coup. It was going to be my little footnote in the world of performance. Shakespeare has been performed in so many different ways over the years, never with no skin on my face. <laughs> Lady Macbeth. And um, Jordan and I get to the airport, and I said, Jordan, the only way we're going to get through this trip is we have to engage with ourselves as performance artists, because this is like a mission. This is a pilgrimage, honey. And the only way we're going to get through this is if we pretend that we're saints. And saints ignore every bad thing that happens to us. We will not pick up on negativity. We will not address it, we will ignore it, and not only will we ignore it, we will shine love through our eyes when we receive it. And fortunately, because Jordan's a performance artist and so am I, my voice teacher taught me how I can drop my breath, I can drop the viscera of my um, stomach, can release the anal sphincter, releasing the anal sphincter creates a kind of um, tingling sensation that can move right through me, it can come out of the eyes, it registers as sparkles, you can call it a performance art trick, or you can call it white lighting yourself, you can call it filling yourself with the love, the holy Madonna, Jordan, that's exactly what we're going to have to do when we go through that airport, and we get to the airport, and Jordan's passport is expired, <laughs> he's freaking out, oh my god, oh my god, he's saying, I fucked up your trip, this is your one chance, your book with Dr. Sunny, your boyfriend spent all this money, oh my god, I can't believe I fucked up, I fucked up your whole life, Jordan, I don't know, if you, if you need to go through this, <laughs> if you need to freak out to sort yourself out, by all means, please have that process, but I actually don't need you to do that. What I need you to do is come together, honey. You need to come together right away because we need to go downtown in a cab to downtown Toronto to the passport office and get you a emergency passport. He saw the love that I was giving to him. Immediately, he responded with love. So the question is not if the performance art metaphor is working. The question is, how far can we take this? We zipped downtown to that passport office. There was a lineup, three hours long. I said, Jordan, the other thing about saints is that saints have so much faith that they know that everything that happens, happens for a reason. And everything that happens for a reason always happens for the best possible outcome of 
anyway. We have to believe, we not only have to believe it, it is real, and we are waiting in that lineup, and I'm a well-known person, a well-known performance artist in Toronto, and this gay man walked by and he was like, oh, oh my God, Nina, what are you doing here at the passport office? I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you about that. Me and my friend Jordan going down to Mexico, and Jordan's passport's expired, so we have to get we have to get that emergency passport. And he was like, "What are you going down to Mexico for, girl?" <laughs> With just a touch of shade, he was saying it. <laughs> <laughs> to which I replied, "With the full love of everything that I feel for the surgical procedures, for more surgery, honey." <laughs> And when he saw that, he was like, girl, let me take you to the front of the lineup. Let me see what I can do for Jordan. We had that sorted out. We were back on the plane for a later flight. And the next good thing that happened is we had more leg room on the flight because with our new seats, we were seated by the emergency exit. So I was like, see, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> also, this is a question of how far can we take it? And then, of course, we'd missed our connecting flight from Mexico City to Guadalajara because the flight was so late. So we had to stay overnight in Mexico City. And I said, okay, well, that's fine. But what I want you to do, Jordan, then, is I want you to take me to the most beautiful, biggest, most famous churches and basilicas in Mexico City. And we'll go and we'll pray for a good surgical outcome because that's exactly what a saint would do. <laughs> and we contacted Dr. Sun and said it was okay that we're going to get down there late. And we go to the most famous basilica in Mexico City. It's so big. It's so beautiful. It's colonial architecture. So, you know, there's something politically incorrect about loving that beauty. <laughs> Cortez actually built it after he conquered Mexico. He tore down the Aztec temples and built Catholic cathedrals on the same site. And yet, that kind of Catholicism, it's not a Catholicism of restraint. The Mexican Catholicism, it's gilded, it's gold, it's decadent, it's rich, it has too many spires. And out of the steeple, right at the front of the church, at every hour comes out on a little railway track an animatronic Virgin Mary. <laughs> like at Disneyland, except for it's not like Disneyland because it's not kitsch. It's not kitsch when you're down there. They take it very seriously. And through an audio recording, she um, speaks songs to the crowd. <clears throat> and they listen with great seriousness. It's, it's not ironic. Or perhaps it is, I'm not sure. <clears throat> but it's serious. And then after she leaves, um, St. Peter comes out. And then after he leaves, uh, Christ comes out on the cross and actually says that it is accomplished. They're fake. They're not fake. They're animatronic saints, just like you and me, Jordan. And we go into the cathedral. Oh my god, it's beautiful. Marble columns. The ceiling is so high, the mass is pre-recorded in a female voice, so it's an audio recording of a sermon coming through the, <coughs> the reverberation of the sound goes right through the marble floor, it comes up through the wooden pews, it goes up through our anal sphincters and vibrates right out of our bodies through friendly eyes with love. Jordan, I couldn't live here. Seriously, I could move here. And it's so easy to be in the moment when everything is beautiful around you because you want to be in that moment. And there's no transphobia inside the basilica except for these two women who called me hombre when I went up, when I went up to the, the altar at the front. But Jordan said they don't know what they're talking about, so I didn't pay attention. On the sides of the cathedral are holy mannequins of the saints. They're made out of fiberglass, all of the saints in the row on the side. And um, because they're made of fiberglass, it kind of looks like the saints have had plastic surgery. <laughs> so, of course, I love that. And the way they're sculpted, I don't know who makes them, but they really have it right. 
You can look into their eyes. You're all, are you real in there? Are you real underneath that? Because it looks like the saints are sparkling above their third eye. That's really, really good. This worked out wonderfully, Jordan. The next morning, we got on a plane and we went to Guadalajara. Dr. Sonny sent someone to meet us at the airport. But Dr. Sonny wasn't going to do the surgery because it was now Sunday. And Dr. Sonny's Catholic and he won't perform surgeries on Sunday because of that. And so we stayed in Guadalajara another day. And we went to churches and cathedrals again all day and prayed for a good result. By the way, I was not um, religious at all before I went down. But the believing in it, it had taken on a kind of quality where we weren't trying to believe in it anymore. We weren't acting it. It had taken on its own momentum. The imagery around us, life itself, was creating this spiritual experience. It was absolutely wonderful. And then at the next morning, I knew Dr. Sunny was going to come to perform the operation. He said he was going to get to the my room at about 8 a.m. So I woke up at 6 to stretch and also to put on my makeup and do my hair. You saw what I look like without my hair and makeup done. And um, I just couldn't let Dr. Sunny see me like that. He has to see what he's working with. He has to see my daily presentation. And it's a very, very, very difficult thing to meet your maker. <laughs> the man who turned me into a woman, the man who made me beautiful, the man who made me sexy. What do I mean to Dr. Sunny? Because this is one of the most important days of my entire life. Is today just a Monday morning to him? Am I just pure form for Dr. Sunny to carve? Am I just flesh? Does Dr. Sunny know that I have a soul? And does Dr. Sunny see me as a woman? And Dr. Sunny come into the room, and he has a spring in his step. Dr. Sunny is a man, and yet he has the spirit of a young child with him at all times. There's a sparkle in his eye, but you see the young boy in him that's very, very attractive. And Dr. Sunny's about six foot five, big mountain hands in latex surgical gloves. He's a rugged man. And I told him, I want a millimeter here, I want a millimeter there, a millimeter there. He's looking at me. It's like I don't even need to be telling him what I need to do. He knows already what I need to do. And uh, then I take my wigs off so he can take me into the surgical theater. And even though I have no hair, he put uh, a hairnet on my head. And he told me that I look beautiful. And then I was like, do you want me to take my makeup off? He was like, no, 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 you can leave your makeup on because all of the incisions are going to be on the outside of your head. And then Sunny wheeled me up a spiral ramp in the center of the hospital that goes through frosted glass doors, gilded frames, and then through another set of double frosted gilded doors and into the surgical theater. Right before I go into the surgical theater, Dr. Sunny has one of those religious eyeglass mannequins, the Archangel Michael. In one arm, he has a flaming sword, i.e. the scalpel. In the other hand, he has the scales. And on the light <coughs> side of the scales are coins. And on the heavy side of the scales, Dr. Sunny has put a rosary in there. And the face of the mannequin bears an uncanny resemblance to Dr. Sunny. <laughs> That's just how smart that man is. That's just how wonderful Dr. Sunny is. And you see that? That's the last thing you see before you go into the operating theater. And I lay down on the table. And I told Dr. Sunny, Dr. Sunny, I want Jordan to video the surgery because I want to stay awake during the surgery because I want to do um, a performance art thing. Would it be okay if we did that? And Sunny says that it's not okay because he doesn't allow cameras inside the surgical theater and that even if I stayed awake during the facelift, I'd be paralyzed. The only thing that I'd be able to move is my eyes. And then Sunny asked me if I want to stay awake anyways. 
just to have the experience of staying awake. I don't want to feel any pain. And I don't want to feel any anxiety. But I want to be completely aware of everything that's happening. And Dr. Sunny said, okay, baby. <laughs> baby, just close your eyes. Everything is going to be okay. But I kept my eyes open. I looked that man right in the eyes. And for a moment, I touched him. I touched Dr. Sunny. I saw what was inside of him. And what was inside of him was that he was thinking, you are a freak. And what was inside of me is, yeah, so are you. I just saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and now, you know that I know that you know that we both know. <laughs> and Dr. Sunny put the anesthetic needle into my vein. And the anesthetist turned on the anesthesia machine. When the anesthetic, oh my god, <laughs> Dr. Sunny, I didn't say that, I just thought that. <laughs> Dr. Sunny, when that anesthetic starts coursing through your veins, it's warm, it's viscous, and you can feel it moving through your veins with every heartbeat. Beep, 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 beep. Beat, beat. That pulls it up through your veins, and you can feel the geometry of the inside of your body. I've never had sensation. The geometry of mapping of my arteries as the warm fluid moved through my arm and into my shoulder and into the three chambers of my heart that I could now feel. It felt like love. It felt like warmth. It feels like compassion. Ah. Ah. Oh, I wish Jordan could feel this. And then Dr. Sunny took the breathing tube and looking me in the eyes the whole time, oh, you are a freak. Just like, <laughs> like Dr. Sunny, fucking love you, man. <laughs> he took the breathing tube. I put it down my throat, and it went down about that far. Mm -hmm. And then he turned on the life support machine. That would now take over my breathing. Wow, I thought I could drop my breath and my viscera. That machine puts so much air inside of you, it pushes everything onto the pelvic floor. And once all of that's pushed onto the pelvic floor, the genitals, the perineum, the anal sphincter, the body responds with a pleasurable sensation that rises upwards. And it also slows your breathing down so slowly. Ah, oh, it's nirvana, Dr. Sunny. In fact, it's in physiologically impossible it's physiologically impossible to go into this. Oh my god, oh my god, I'm afraid. There's going to be knives in my face. Oh my god, I'm afraid. That can't happen <laughs> because of the technology. I watched that man reach for the scalpel, looking directly into his eyes. I've never had intimacy like this with a man before. I looked into his eyes as he put the scalpel into my face. I could hear the flesh separate. I could hear the muscle separate. I could hear the scar tissue from previous surgeries separate. And that sounded like a hundred little ropes snapping that had been bound too tightly with each other. And um, wow, that felt good because I'm not feeling any pain at all. I registered the sensation. I felt everything, except for it felt wonderful. Oh my God, talk about s and <laughs> And I just want to say at this point, because Dr. Sunny had that look, that look of a child behind the eyes of a man. I just want to say that I did not feel that I was sexually violated on the surgical table. We had made an agreement that I was going to be the 
a recipient of these acts, and Dr. Sunny was going to be the perpetrator of these acts, and yet behind this experience, we were both having an experience behind our eyes. I thought that plastic surgery would be a decided, slow movement. I thought he would be careful with me, but he took his hands and moved my head like that on the surgical table. Fuck, it's going to be like that. Okay, so if this is going to be erotic and it's going to be like sex, it's going to be a little bit rough. Or a lot rough. Great. Um, and then he started moving into my face with scissors because they don't just cut you with scalpel, they cut you with the scissors. And he started moving across the top of the forehead with the scissors. It's not slow, careful, decided movement. It's not with Dr. Sunny. Doctor, it's like watching an artist. If you've ever seen an artist, a great painter or a great actor, just impulses moving through them, uncensored, in the moment. Maybe Jackson Pollock on a, on a canvas, but uh, certainly don't make my face look like a Jackson Pollock, <laughs> Dr. Sunny. But wow, was he moving. It was exciting. Dr. Sunny's not just a surgeon. Dr. Sunny's an artist. He is a great artist. Fuck, I love you, Dr. Sunny. And as he was peeling back the skin, I noticed that there's two surgical lamps um, above the surgical table. They had near domes, so I could see the entire tableau taking place. I could see the nurses, Dr. Sunny, myself on the operating table inside the mirrored reflections of the lamps. And it, the imagery I was getting, it's like out of a Terry Gilliam film, like out of Brazil or something. <laughs> And yet it was reality. It was a real experience, but it was an aesthetic experience. And my makeup, I was painted so beautifully, <laughs> I thought. And uh, then a drip of blood poured down from the incision, pooled up into my left eye. And so all I saw there was red. Dr. Sunny grabbed some gauze and so tenderly, just like he was dabbing tears from a child, took that blood from my eye, and it's totally appropriate that he treated me like a child, just a newborn baby at that moment. He was watching my vital signs. I was paralyzed. He was controlling my breathing. He was keeping me alive. He was cutting me open. He was making me beautiful. And you don't do that unless you're dealing with the most precious part of a person. And Dr. Sunny understood that. And then after he got the blood out of my eye, he grabbed a cauterizer, which is a needle with an electric point at the end that heats up, and he took that artery and he sealed it shut. I could smell the burnt flesh, my own burnt flesh, in tendrils going into my own nose. Oh my god, it smells beautiful. It's absolutely cannibalistic. I didn't know how invasive a facelift was. I thought they just cut you and pulled you. He was inside me, repositioning the soft palate, anchoring the muscle tissue to the back of the skull. I think that's called the occipital bone. And he had to test the new facial muscles, so he pulled on the muscles like this to test my smile. And when he tested the smile, I felt happy. And when he tested the frown by pulling down, I felt sad. And when he pulled the brow to test that, I felt awake. I felt very, very aware of things on your puppet. And maybe it was the anesthetic, but the, the surgical team, their own movements were taking on a staccato quality, like they were kabuki actors or puppets themselves, I was watching the impulses move through the surgeon. He was like a puppet of God. I couldn't quite see the strings that were attaching him to God, but almost. And then I looked into those surgical globes, the two mirrors. Those were, those are, they might be, it could just be me hallucinating, it could just be the moment. Those could be the eyes of God looking down upon me. That could be my truth right now that those are the eyes of God watching me. I noticed that the surgical mirrors had bevels in a honeycomb shape, 
as if the eyes of God were the eyes of a spider that's made up of hundreds of little eyes, but the eyes of God could be watching us from every perspective at the exact same time, that the eyes of God were watching me from the perspective that I'm a child, that this was worshipful, that this was a legitimate worship of the virtue of beauty, that I'm an addict, that I'm a plastic surgery addict, that I'm some kind of explorer, that I'm a saint. But this is meaningless. That this is what my parents are going to see when they die. They're going to see this moment. The walls of the operating theater are blue. They started to glow. It felt that I was, I felt that I was in the inside of an aquarium, except for the inside of the aquarium was full of air, and everywhere else was water and the surgical instruments were glittering like they weren't surgical steel, they were silver. I had never seen silver glitter like that before. I could feel every stitch going inside of me, around the muscles. Each stitch felt wonderful going inside. I thought of myself as a cyborg before because I'd had so many surgical procedures. I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm basically like a cyborg. There's so much of me that's technologically innovative. And yet, thinking of oneself as a cyborg feels very cold. It doesn't feel very sexual, does it? It doesn't feel hot. And yet, each of the technological innovations was starting to feel very, very good and very, very sexy. And then under the eyes of God, I realized I was pulsing so much on that surgical table, just throbbing, that I could have been the radiating Virgin of Guadalupe at the front of the church. It wasn't a performance artist playing at ritual. It was a ritual. It was a hieroglyph in time and space that symbolized the control and the eroticization, the control over women's bodies. And just how fucking hot that is for everyone. It was an aesthetic experience. It was a surgical experience. It was a spiritual experience. I didn't want it to end. It was the best experience of my life. And when I thought it could not get any better, Above Dr. Sunny's right shoulder appeared a golden cobra about six foot high in the air. Its hood was splayed. It was distinctly Egyptian. Its eyes are obsidian black and the hood is splayed. The quality of the movement of the cobra as it approaches the surgical table is not like an organic creature, and yet it does not move like a mechanical either. I can't even describe the quality of its movement. And the eyes are black. They offer absolutely no warmth. This creature is not here to heal me. She's not here to offer love. And yet I see in her a profound emptiness. And that is, I understand that as an incredible blessing. On the hood of the cobra are markings. I can't quite make them out. They might be violin markings in the same way that Man Ray put violin markings on the back of a woman in a famous photograph. I'm not sure. The cobra looks at me only for a moment and then turns to watch the proceedings of the facelift. Dr. Sunny pulls on all of the tissues of my neck to do the neck lift. I can feel the muscle being stretched and torn right from here in the sternum. It feels like he's choking me. And as he winds that up and reattaches the flesh, and takes his hands off me, it still feels like he's choking me. It still feels like Dr. Sunny's hands are right there. 
which is a very, very good feeling. And then he starts sewing me up, so I know it's going to be over soon. He pulls the breathing tube out of my mouth. He takes the anesthetic needle out of my veins. So I start breathing normally. And start returning to real life, regular life. Because it's all real. And then the surgical team grabs the piece of fabric that I'm laying on and they pull me off the surgical table and I realize that the fabric is actually a diaper sheet because it crinkles. And that's also totally appropriate because I was in this pre-social, pre-intellectual state. I could have shit myself right there on the surgical table and just loved it, just loved it the way a baby loves it when it shits myself. <laughs> just love the warmth of it all. And then they wheel me back to my room. And Jordan says, how are you? I was like, amazing. Oh my god, you have no idea what I've just been through, Jordan. Jordan, will you take a photograph of me? And he took a photograph of me in that moment. We're going to look at it later, maybe. And then I said, oh, honey, I think this is going to be a very, very easy recovery. I've never had a plastic surgery that was this positive, but I'm going to tell you all about it, but please bring me my journal because I want to write everything down. And I started writing all of the details down, and then Dr. Sunny come into the room with just bouncing like a little boy, and he took gauze and he wrapped my head so tenderly. Wrapped me up. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote. And then a few hours passed. <laughs> After that happened, the painkillers wore off. I cannot describe the pain. Actually, yes, I can. <laughs> it felt like someone was pulling, that feeling where someone's pulling your hair. Except for it was out of every piece of my face, my skull and neck, and it didn't let up. It didn't let up ever. It was unrelenting. That's what it felt like. And because of all the incisions around the outside of my face, it felt like an animal had my head in its face and its teeth were around me and it was shaking me like that. I said, Jordan, Jordan, oh, honey, go, go, please go out into the city. Do as you will. I'm in so much pain. I can't even be in your presence, honey. And lay there. All I could do, I'm not even being glib about this, all I could do is draw my breath, use the actor training <coughs> to drop the breath onto the pelvic floor. It doesn't take the pain away, but what it does is it adds pleasure to pain. Oh, oh, oh. Whoever carves those mannequins does it so flawlessly. I could see myself from the outside and from the inside like I always can. And I knew that the expression on my face was exactly like those mannequins. And then a few days went by, five, and it was time for the post-surgical visit with Dr. Sunny so he could take the sutures out. He sees all the post-operative patients on the same day, so the waiting room was full of women, beautiful women. There was a gorgeous Mexican girl with long blonde hair and hair extensions, Dior shoes, eyes black and swollen with bandages over her nose because that's what happens when they break your nose for a facelift, you have two black eyes. There she sat. Beautiful, rich woman. 
a woman who could barely sit up and stand because of her large breast implants that she'd had done, she arrived in a wheelchair. There we were in the waiting room, and all kind of looking at each other out of the corners of our eyes. Each of us has that special secret. That special secret that while the rest of us, while the rest of you are in the room just having plastic surgery, that each of us has a special secret erotic relationship with the doctor. And then when I realized that, I realized Dr. Sonny treated me like a trick. <laughs> he took my money, thousands of dollars, exactly the way I would treat my clients as a whore. I would take their money, but I would treat them with the biggest possible heart that I could. And then Dr. Sonny arrived, magically, and whisked me upstairs through the frosted double doors, through the gilded doors. He took the stitches out one by one, told me that he didn't like goodbyes, so it was just till next time. And then he was out the door. Dr. Sonny has a very, very good thing going on down there with these women. God bless you, Dr. Sonny. <coughs> and then Jordan met me in the waiting room. Soon it would be time for me to get on the plane, so to go back to Toronto. <laughs> Jordan, I really just don't want it to be over. And I was so weak. But I was like, you have to protect me, honey. When we go into the airport, if people come for me, I'm actually not strong enough to stand up for them. You have to look out for me, Jordan. And Jordan is a saint. And he shielded me. He stood in front of me when he needed to stand in front of me. And he stood behind me when he needed to stand behind me. And then we got back to Toronto. And then it was over. That, that wonderful, compelling thing that um, 
that, that beautiful thing when, when, a, when a transsexual transitions and she becomes so convincing that you, you can't tell that she ever was a transsexual. I could never fool people. Only for a moment. In the, in the monologue, you talk about, uh, or so you say, quote, yeah. if, if I cannot look like a normal woman, I will sacrifice being normal. I will be plastic. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about giving yourself permission to go to Mexico to see your plastic surgeon, Dr. Sunny, yeah. and to, quote, get artistic with my body. Yes. Um, this moment in your life, and this idea of self-portraiture, which is <coughs> invoked in the title of the, of the, um, of the monologue, mm -hmm. or the story, um, and when you begin to give yourself permission to not pursue normative conceptions of beauty, it, it, has, it has become central to your, um, your artistic work um, and, and your life. Um, and I say that because you've, dis you've described all of your work, including the work with your body. Can I say something before you continue the sure. question? That is, um, because I was never passable as a, as a transsexual, so I was always readable as a, as a trans. It still meant that I faced an incredible amount of oppression and discrimination of all the time. Um, so I, I thought, it, it, it's not only that I thought, oh, I could turn myself into a living self-portrait. That, that, that's what I thought of as an artist. I could, I could um, surrender, I suppose, to the, this impulse inside me that I wanted to create self-portraits over and over, and that I could actually do that in a profound way through plastic surgery. I could build the, the portrait right onto my face. But also, I want to say that um, I didn't really see any better options in life. Uh, I, I couldn't really live a normal life. I wasn't a normal woman. I, I, I couldn't really get a job. I, I couldn't... Um, walk down the street without facing discrimination. So I, I, it's, it's a very rarefied thing to do. And yet, um, I didn't know what else to do either. So the, the, yeah, the question is, could you talk about self-portraiture mm -hmm. um, as it relates to both that decision in, in, in your life, in yeah. your um, relationship with your own body, and the, the works that the more overtly artistic? performances and photographic work and etc. as forms of self-portraiture. I have this panic of altruism. <laughs> Thank you. I have this panic of altruism that I'm going to um, say the wrong thing or, or hurt people when I talk to them. And so the idea of actually doing stories about other people, representing other people, even representing transsexuals at large, is um, terribly frightening because I, 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 I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> and yet, paradoxically, I suppose it's utterly offensive to spend this much of your life doing self-portraiture. Um, And yet, I love it. I love it. I love doing it, so I do it. Yeah. And um, I don't feel like I have this fixed identity that's, that, that it's like I have one identity that's um, just, just me all the time, that I'm one thing. I feel like I'm always becoming new things, new people. I don't think I'm any different than anyone else, really. Um, and yet I, I have this thing inside of me that wants to represent it, that wants to iconize it. Maybe it's I'm afraid that when I die, no one's going to remember me, or maybe I feel that to leave something behind. Because um, I always thought as a transsexual that uh, I wouldn't live past 40 because the, the, the trannies who are in my community, the girls in the generation above me, it's changing now because human rights are different. But all of us were, or most of us were sex workers and all, all of the women died of AIDS or drug addiction or what, what I saw is it was all fine and good and fun if you were beautiful and you could hook and make money, you could make a lot of money. You could be sexy and fabulous, but 
as you aged and you lost your beauty, that our, our beauty, our, our sexual currency, was the only thing that was valued of that generation. I'm talking about the generation of transsexuals who existed before the internet, even. So it's a, a quite a different paradigm even to understand. Because a lot of people's responses to a transsexual was, what? You have a dick? You have a fucking dick? And people just couldn't even get past that. That was, that was before transsexuals were even on, really on TV or anything. And so what we always had was our sexual currency that we could sell our bodies to straight men that had this fetish. Or maybe it's not a fetish, I don't know. So we always had that. And then when that was gone, we, we didn't, what I saw was an entire generation of women who didn't know how to make their way in the world. So I thought that I wasn't going to live very long. And now the way culture and life has changed because human rights have moved forward and we are more accepted. I think there's lots of changes, obviously, that have to happen still. But uh, I think, wow, I have a very long life ahead of me. I, I hadn't anticipated that. So I think, yeah, I thought no one was going to remember me or my life wouldn't have meaning. Or, um, <coughs> And also, I would also like like to acknowledge the, um, that sounds very, perhaps, heroic, but I would also like to acknowledge the extreme narcissism of it, of the practice of constantly making icons of yourself, and um, the vanity of that and, and the narcissism of that was also very, very pleasurable to me. And so I engaged in that, and I, I don't deny that. and. Um, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone, I don't see any reason not, not to do it. Um, narcissism is such a loaded term nowadays. It comes with such cultural baggage. And um, no one wants to admit that they're, they have narcissistic qualities, but I think we all do. And I think our culture is becoming more and more narcissistic all the time. And um, paradoxically, I, I think people are becoming more and more narcissistic all the time, and yet paradoxically more um, adamant that they're not narcissistic. <laughs> so so the, the, those polarized positions, yeah. And and so I just do it. I do it because I I I, I actually think that. Um, this cultural move through narcissism, through greater narcissism, I, I actually think it's part of social evolution on a global scale. Um, I don't think it, I know it, because it's happening, it's happening to all of us, in that there's an entire generation of children now who do not know what it's like to grow up without digital representations of themselves, without an avatar of themselves. Um, thousands of years ago, it was actually impossible to even have a representation of oneself. The only way to, to, to make representations was to do a cave painting or be a priest, and it was only priests and very sacred people who were allowed to create representations. But now everyone can do it quite, quite readily, so the, the practice is moving forward. Everyone wants to say that Narcissism is very, very bad, and yet we are all doing it. I know Facebook. Yeah, yeah well, we all do. So I, I think our culture has a very schizophrenic response to it. It says you have to do this to be a part of culture, and yet you also have to deny that it's pleasurable. And it's, exact, it's the exact same thing that I think patriarchy has done to women, which is to say to many women, not only I'm going to give you all of these images all the time that tells you your greatest value is in your looks and your sexual currency. If patriarchy only did that, I think actually women would actually, um, we wouldn't have this schizophrenia. The problem with patriarchy is it gives us all of those messages and it says, but if you do it, you're superficial. So I'm going to tell you this is where your value is but you're not allowed to acknowledge it, and you're not allowed to speak it. So that double standard, I think, fucks us up. 
And I, I, so, just maybe to conclude this ramble, if you looked at, um, I think if you looked at, say, something that happens during the fall of the Roman Empire or during the time of Alexander the Great or um, when Octavian was conquering Egypt, um, you would, if you, if you took a psychological lens and applied it to most of the population, say just the male population at that time, they would actually qualify as sociopaths. You would have an entire population of sociopaths if we put a psychological framework on that behavior. And yet that was part of human evolution, social evolution. So I don't actually think anyone is a psychological pathology. I just think this is a wave of human behavior that we're moving through. And we have to acknowledge that we're moving through it. But we should also, we should also move through it with the biggest hearts possible. We should move through it also with empathy. We should, and you can't do that if you don't acknowledge that, it, that it's happening. And I'm not saying the answer is everyone go out and <coughs> not stop that portraiture. That's, that's just what I'm doing. I don't think I can solve the whole problem. I'm just, I'm just inside the wave like everyone else. Often the self-portraiture is sort of organized around a kind of archetype. Yes. Um, could, would you speak a little bit about that, like the kinds of archetypes that you've organized some, some particular works around? Or? Yeah, sure. Do you know, just in, in the same way that I tell that story that my friend Jordan and I went down to Mexico, and as performance artists, I was like, these people, to, to get through this, we have to be like saints. <laughs> so just in the same way, if I was acting in a play, I might look at the character and say, um, um, yeah, that would say, what is that character, what's her archetype, psychologically or mythologically, what's her archetype, and I love mythology and folklore, and I know a lot about it, so I can, I can look at, at that and I identify it. And so I can also look at my own life and say, what images am I seeing in my own life, what is my own behavior, how present can I be? <coughs> and say, what, what, what mythological archetype am I living at this time? Um, so I've gone through different periods where I felt that um, the narcissist archetype was, was, was very predominant, and sometimes I felt like I was really living for the hunt, living for the hunt of what's next, what's the next surgery, what's the next thing I can do, and so I was like, that's Diana, the goddess of the hunt, or Artemis, and I'm living that, and so not only am I living it, what do I want my version of the archetype to be? And sometimes I was worshipping beauty, I was stuck inside the archetype of Aphrodite. So how do I want to manifest Aphrodite in the world? It's just my way of, um, I suppose, performing my life. Because um, we're all performing our lives. Um, we, we all know that if you're in theater. Um, so how do I want to perform my life, and how do I perform it with the most vitality and the, the most eroticism, the, the, the most hotness, the most empathy? And then, yeah, so yeah. And then lately I feel like I'm in the, the, the archetype of the whore at Babylon. Okay, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, <laughs> what she means to me. But you made a pin-up calendar to the apocalyptic whore at Babylon kind of calendar. That's right, yes. So she, she means to me this kind of unbridled sexual impulse that never stops. She gives in to her pleasures, she gives in to what, whatever she wants, and she's interested in power, she recognizes that power exists, and so she wants some, and that's okay for her to be a woman and want that. The whore of Babylon. The, the whore, whore of Babylon. Babylon. Yeah, the whore of Babylon. Um, so she recognizes that power exists and she wants some. She recognizes that hierarchy exists and she's interested in rising through it. I'm sick to fucking death of these liberal hypocrites who tell me that everyone is an equal and so I should stop making such a big fucking deal about myself and start acting like an equal. And yet it's always some white man in power who's telling me to stop <laughs> making such a big deal about myself and that power doesn't exist and stop being status oriented and stop trying to get ahead in the world. Should start working for the common fucking good. 
and power doesn't exist, but he's in power, but he's telling me that power doesn't exist, mm -hmm. and that I should accept that, and he doesn't want me to just pay lip service to it, he wants me to really believe it, and believe it with enthusiasm, not fake the belief of it, so be like, you're turning me into, it's like, it's like, it's like just back when I was a fucking whore, you're turning me into your fucking whore, but you want me to love you, but you want me to love you exactly the way you want to love, you want me to love you, and you want me to love you, exactly the way you want to get fucked and you want to get laid and you want it to be exactly how you want it but you want that to be real for me. So it's like, where the fuck is that? <laughs> and so, um, okay, sure, I'll be your whore because that'll get me ahead. And um, that's what they say when you're a woman. But when you're a man, they actually just say that's having a job. <laughs> <laughs> And so the man can say that he's a Marxist. <laughs> the man can say, I'm a Marxist. Now it's referring to me that we keep saying man. <laughs> well, I'm sort of looking over there yeah. at this, like, you know, <laughs> this, you know, this man, white, white man of power over there. I, I know a few of them. And, uh, do you know, I even dated a few of them, or I had a few of them as my tricks. And, um, you know, the, the white man in power can say that he's a Marxist and he's fighting for the social good. And that's his moral standpoint, and he can do it with a smile on his face. But as an oppressed person in culture, every time I show up at a place where everyone's supposed to get treated like an equal, I'm at the bottom rung of the totem pole, and they're saying to me, why won't you just come to grips with reality and accept that you're small, worthless, a freak, someone who doesn't have currency in culture, and I'm always like, that doesn't really work for me. <laughs> so it's like, I could, I could agree to the consensus of their reality, I could, you know, but frankly, Marxism doesn't really offer me a place. There was, you know, I, when I was down in Mexico, actually with Jordan, part of the story I don't tell is, we were actually walking, we walked on to um, Occupy Mexico. We had just happened onto it. And the protesters of Occupy Mexico started throwing water bottles at me because they thought I was mocking their protest, that my very presence felt a caricature to them. They felt that I was turning their struggle for social equality into an ironic comment. And yet all I was was walking by. So Marxism doesn't really offer me much. Although, I've, um, and yet, being a Republican doesn't really feel well either. <laughs> Although there is something about it that appeals to me. Um, I made a couple of appearances on um, CNN to talk about some stuff, and um, I guess that's like the Democratic that's like the liberal news station down here. So <laughs> what's liberal to you, for us up in Canada, is like very conservative. And so a lot of my theater colleagues were um, furious that I would participate in that media. And yet I found that they, they, they liked working with me. They, they wanted me to be as smart as I could possibly be. They liked that I was detail-oriented. They liked that I was taking care of the idea that I wanted to look good on camera and that I wanted to be very, very intelligent. And um, whenever I, I, I deal with Marxists and um, these liberals, they always want me to be this, they have always this idea of what I should be, this good transsexual. I should, I should say this, I should act like this, I shouldn't say that, I should, shouldn't be that. So they're always trying to put words in my mouth and trying to take my power away. And then I deal with these conservatives and they're like, I like you, you're an independent thinker, you're detail oriented, you want to get ahead in the world. So for me, it's not even a question of um, my philosophical politics, what I believe, it's a question of my lived politics, living in the world, what actually, where there's actually space for me. And um, yeah. So conservative, yeah, I find conservative men love me. <laughs> and um, 
um, you know, and um, a lot of, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I maybe have said already quite a bit about the subject, but it's obviously quite passionate, you know.